Hello, small baby humans. Hey, it's weird. I haven't done one of these in like two weeks because you guys have been like working on projects and stuff. But I'm back with today's version of In Case You Missed It. Uh, so today is Monday, October 19th. Sorry, I had to look at the actual day. You know, pandemic brain. Um, and in case you missed something or, you know, Wanted to go back and just, you know, spend more quality time with this guy right here. Um, here is the rundown on what we did. All right. So I'm going to go into present mode and um, I'm gonna get you guys all caught up on what's going on. Okay. All right. So if you don't like clowns, I really apologize for what I've done to you here. But it is October and we are nearing in on Halloween. So I'm going to share some of my favorites with you. Okay. So today is the 19th, like I said. And um, this is kind of the rundown on what's big uh, this week, I did leave one thing off of here, but uh, we'll go through that in a second. Um, first of all, the tic-tac-toe was due last Friday. Um, now, I'm going to be real honest with you guys. I'm in the process of going through grading those and entering grades, but I also know that I'm missing a lot of them. Um, I understand that it was a self-paced project, but it was a self-paced project, project with a due date, and that due date was Friday. I am still going to take late work on that, so if you... Um, are currently working on projects or need to work on projects, please make sure you get those done and into me in the near future. We are running out of time and I do want to be able to get you enough time to use feedback and, and fix some things on them should you want to. Okay. Second important point, um, the quarter ends in eight school days. Uh, next Wednesday, October 28th is the end of the quarter. Um, so eight school days or 10, you know, physical actual days. And, um, that's when the semester of American history is going to end for you guys. We don't get to spend any quality time together until January. Um, none of me annoying you or rattling at you, which I apologize for. I, I'm usually way more fun. This online thing takes some of it away. But some reminders about why the end of the quarter is important. First of all, your grades lock in forever. Um, your grade that you get in here will be part of an overall grade point average that you're going to get you know, every semester and will eventually add up to what you may send away to colleges or to your tech schools or even some jobs ask for uh, transcripts of some kind. So um, you're going to want to make sure and get your grades up, not just in this class, but on your classes as much as you can, because those things do stay with you um, um, forever, especially when you're applying uh, to things at the next level. Um, second reason why you want to make sure you're doing well is, is you want to earn the half a credit for this class. Uh, credit is going to be assigned on October 28th for the four classes you're in. You do need 24 credits to graduate from high school. And, um, you know, this class right here is one of the required ones. So you got to make sure you pass it and you want to get that credit. Um, last but not least, you know, you guys are involved in activities like sports and other activities. Um, your semester, quarter, whatever gets decided on October 28th. Part of that's going to go into deciding whether or not you're eligible uh, for your athletic events and for your other things. So, you know, if you want to play and you don't want to watch from the sidelines in uh, regular clothes, make sure you guys get your grades up. One other thing I didn't put in here about the quarter ending is on Thursday night from 4 to 8, there are going to be some digital online parent-teacher conferences. Uh, Mr. Sivrud, I think, sent out an email about that, and uh, I do know that I have some parental units signed up to meet with me. Um, in other words, it'd be good to have all your work in. Okay. Uh, something new that I don't know got mentioned to you guys, but uh, you guys took the star reading test last Thursday. I think it was second hour. Uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday, you're going to take the star math test third hour. So if you're a freshman through a junior, uh, you're going to get your math on tomorrow, third hour. I hope you're ready to go on that. I think it's the first time the high school's given us. So here is what today holds in store for us. We're going to start looking at chapter four, uh, which is about the populist era. Actually, the last unit we're going to do, we're going to do is going to be a combo of chapter four and chapter five. So we're going to look a little bit at the populist era, but we're also going to look at imperialism and expansionism. And then obviously in class, we had some work time for the final assignment. If you're watching this a lot, that time, how you feel like you need to, um, this is going to be the last assignment for the quarter. So it is important to do a good job on it because you do want to leave that, you know, that good last impression on the grade book and me. So uh, we're going to jump ahead and we're going to start talking about the stuff we need to talk about a little clip from the office there. Um, chapter four uh, is kind of a pain in the butt in a way, but I made it less painful. Um, used to be that it was 50 slides. It took forever. It was a lot of politics. It was really boring. Even I hated teaching it. I didn't look forward to the two weeks of school that I spent on it. But what I did a few years ago is I really kind of looked at it and said, okay, what are the absolute 
things that people need to know from this unit. And I came down to 12 things. And so I'm gonna teach you guys those 12 things on 12 slides. Now I will tell you this, if you're taking the notes on these, uh, and you should be, because you will be able to use them on the test next Wednesday. Um, you know, the, the, the slides are pretty incomplete. We're to the point in the year where you guys should be able to listen to me a little bit and write down some of the things that are important. So 12 things everybody should know about chapter four, we're gonna do the first two. The first one is, uh, sorry about the graphic, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of stupid looking and a little pixelized, but it gets across the point. And the first topic is the idea of sitting on the fence. And uh, sitting on the fence is a political strategy where candidates or politicians um, don't strongly take a side on a controversial issue. Okay, now there's a number of reasons why they do this, but one of the most simple reasons is politicians realize that if they take a side on an issue, it can tick off part of the voters. And so um, if we look at something and we take like, I don't know, um, vanilla ice cream, right? If vanilla ice cream was important to politicians and they wanted to sit on the fence, they could talk about how vanilla ice cream goes really well with a piece of pie, but maybe it's not everybody's deal. And they kind of go back and forth on the goods and bats. Um, whereas if I said, and I hate vanilla ice cream, I absolutely freaking hate it. I think it's the most pointless thing ever. I might tick off the people that really like vanilla ice cream. And so politicians tend to do this, uh, especially in election years, to kind of try to try to draw votes from each side. Now, all, all honesty, you know, full disclosure, President Trump does not really sit on the fence very often. He usually comes pretty strong with how he feels, whether you agree or disagree. And maybe that is why so many people love him and hate him. Like there doesn't seem to be a much gray area when it comes to the president. Um, now, I'm going to give you an example of, of how this works. So let's say I was running for president this year, uh, 2020. I, I do make the requirements. And let's say this year guns were a big issue. It doesn't really seem that many people are talking about guns and gun control right now. But let's say it was an issue. If I stepped up in front of a, gr a group of people and I gave the following speech, think about how they might think about me. So if I said, my name's Chris Seep and I'm running for president in 2020. Guns and gun control are a major issue in this year's election. And so I want to tell you how I feel about that. Uh, first of all, the Founding Fathers fought hard for our Second Amendment rights to bear arms. And I think that all Americans should not only be allowed to have a gun, but should be able to carry one with them at all time with no limitations. As a matter of fact, I have eight guns on me right now and um, usually I only carry seven, but, you know, kind of a sketchy audience. So I wanted to be prepared. I think that not only should guns be available to people, but there should be no limitations on how many or what kind. You should be able to walk into a store and, and walk out with one right away with no waiting period. If I'm elected, Americans will have a right to have their gun, and they will be they, they will be carrying them wherever they want to. The end. Now, if I gave that speech, half the crowd would be like, yay, you're great, eat, eat, and that finger snap and things some of you guys do. But half the crowd would be like, oh, this is bad. He's going he's gonna to get us all killed. And, and as a politician, I don't want that. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I give this speech. Hi, my name is Chris Seep, and I'm running for president. In this year's election, guns and gun control are an important issue. While the Second Amendment was passed in the 1770s and 1780s, I believe it's outdated. And I, I don't really think that there's a need for Americans to carry guns anymore. Heck, we don't even really need them to hunt. Uh, we can go to the grocery store. So if I'm elected president, part of my campaign rundown is that I want to make sure the only Americans that have guns are the military and the police. And if you have guns, we're going to take them away from you because violent crime in the United States is a problem. Thank you. Now think about the crowd now. Part of the crowd is still cheering for me, but part of the crowd is not. I'm, I might very well get shot, actually. And so politicians want to get as much out of things as possible, and so they may sit on the fence. They may do something like this. Hi, my name's Chris Seep, and I'm running for president here in 2020. Guns and gun control are an important issue on Americans' minds. And while I understand the Founding Fathers' Second Amendment belief that all Americans should be able to carry guns, there are a lot of crimes in the United States related to guns. And so if you elect me president this time, my administration and I will take a hard look at gun control and gun, gun rights laws to see what is best for Americans. From the American hunter to the American soldier, guns are ingrained in American life. However, we do have several problems with them. And so please consider my stance on guns while voting. Thank you. Now, if you think about it, I just sat on the fence. I didn't really say anything. And why do I do that? Because I think the average person is just going to hear what they want to hear, and they're going to vote for me because they, they think I agree with them. 
Okay. Listen for politicians. Because people do this all the time. If you get a weird haircut and you come in and go, what do you think of my hair? And someone goes, oh, it's different. It's really different. Yeah, it's going to take some getting used to. They're sitting on the fence. They didn't go, oh, I really like it. Or, oh, you look like a dork. You know, if you dye your hair, if you wear weird clothes, whatever. People sit on the fence a lot on these things. How do you feel about this new blah, blah, blah? Oh, you know, it's okay. I, you know, I tried it and it was, it was tough, but I, but I kind of had you know, a little fun with it. But, you know, they go back and forth. They're being wishy-washy. They're sitting on the fence. The second topic is, is has to do with art and literature, and it's realism. Now, realism is a type of art based on real life, okay? Um, if, the, if the person's beautiful, we draw them beautiful. If the person's kind of weird looking, we draw them weird looking. If they're underweight or overweight, we draw them that way. If they're muscular, we, we write about them that way. We write how people actually talk. No, Romeo, Romeo, well, for out thou, Romeo. No one talks like that. No one, we go, where's Romeo? Okay, and, and so during this time period in the late 1800s and early 1900s, realism becomes the big style of writing and art and painting and sculpture, and it becomes big in American culture. Before this, everyone used this thing called romanticism, where it was happily ever after, and the princess was beautiful, and the prince was charming, and the kids were well behaved, and everyone kind of had the perfect body build, and there weren't weird old people, and ugly, smelly people, and everybody spoke properly, and all those things. And the problem with romanticism is it's great. It's it's entertaining, man. For two hours to watch, you know, basically a Disney princess story or the notebook where everything ends well, it's, it's kind of nice every once in a while. But people back then kind of hit this point where they were like, everything in my stories ends well, and my life sucks. And so their stories started to make them feel bad. And so artists turned to realism as a way to show people that maybe their lives were normal and that they shouldn't, you know, they're not, it's, it's not all castles and princes and princesses and the, the good guy wins and the bad guy doesn't. Okay. And, and so this kind of became a prevailing kind of art and now they're, they're both around romanticism and realism. But if you think about the number of things that we have that are pretty realistic, a lot of it kind of starts during this time period. Okay. Now, as far as the notes went, that's that's really kind of all we covered today um, because we've got the last assignment for the chapter. I'm going to go into two ways thing, and I'm going to show you guys uh, what it looks like. It's called it's called Seeking Empire, and uh, we'll click on that, and we'll go to the instructions here. Uh, and it's it's due on Friday by midnight. That's that's October 23rd. And it says this is going to be our final assignment for the quarter. Um, so it's your final chance to be evaluated on communication and analysis and research standards. You'll still have a test, so you'll still get one more shot at content. Um, please make sure you're applying the feedback that you've been given throughout the quarter. Do the best in writing complete answers. It's going to be due on Friday. And then um, Seeking Empire is is just it's a reading guide. We probably won't do that many of them second semester. But um, so this might be the last one. I think it's 10, 11 questions. Kind of lagging a little bit there. Last one's kind of opinion-based. Um, like usual, how are we lagging hard? Um, I link the reading right there. And so you've got everything you need. Now, if you need to uh, go back and get some of those notes again, please do that because you can use them on the test. But also, you know, you want to get working on Seeking Empire. Remember, if you're stuck on tic-tac-toe stuff, get it done. Ask for help. I am here to help. I want to help. Um, sometimes I get really bored in the afternoon. All right, ask for help if you need it. Um, we'll see you soon. Bye.